projects that are going on around site-specific installations and different indigenous artists who are engaging um, in different ways, all the way from aesthetics to materials to, to political engagement. And I think that we're, it's an incredible honor and privilege to have uh, Chinupa Hans Luger and Virgil Ortiz uh, with us here today. And I think Um, you'll see that in this conversation today, which we um, anticipate will be exciting, <laughs> um, that they're, they're really doing some incredible work um, in their fields. Um, I will give you a little bit of a short biography and then we're going to jump into the conversation. We do have some images that will be happening behind us as I'm already scrolling through it unintentionally. Um, and we'll engage in some of those, but really it's more about the conversation. So the images will be some examples of, of work that each artist will be talking about. Um, so we'll start with um, Chinupa. Chinupa Hanska Luger is a New Mexico-based multidisciplinary artist who uses social collaboration in response to timely and site-specific issues. Raised on the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, in North Dakota, he's an enrolled member of the three affiliated tribes of Fort Berthold and is of Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, Lakota, and European descent. Luger produces multi-pronged projects that take many forms through multiple ins monumental installations that incorporate ceramics, video, sound, fiber, steel, new media technology, and repurposed materials. He interweaves performance and political action to communicate stories about 21st century indigeneity. This work provokes diverse audiences to engage with indigenous peoples and values apart from the lens of colonial social structuring and often presents a call to action to protect land from capitalist exploits. He combines critical cultural analysis with dedication and respect for the diverse materials, environments, and communities he engages. Uh, his honors and awards are too long for me to list here. Um, you can Google it if you're interested. Um, I will say that uh, as a Smithsonian Fellow and also working as a Creative Capital Fellow, uh, that he has engaged on multiple levels across many different platforms, um, both academic and also uh, community-based. Virgil Ortiz combines art, decor, fashion, video, and film. He's one of the most innovative potters of his time. Ortiz's exquisite works have been exhibited in museum collections around the world. Again, that list is too long to mention here, but trust me, it's long. Um, he is the youngest of six children. He grew up on, in a creative environment in which storytelling, collecting clay, gathering wild plants, and producing figurative pottery was part of everyday life. His grandmother, Lorencita Herrera, and his mother, Seferina Ortiz, were both renowned potters and part of an ongoing matrilineal heritage. Ortiz keeps coaching pottery traditions alive, but, but transforms them into contemporary vision that embraces his Pueblo history and culture and merges it with apocalyptic themes, science fiction, and his own storytelling. Virgil has been working on an epic narrative project for quite some time that reconsiders the Pueblo Revolt and represents how we can imagine history also having an impact on the way that we think about the future. And I think that's a really interesting segue to lead right into our first question and sort of thinking about um, how we, how we're gonna move forward in the conversation. But, the reason why we have Virgil and Chinook here together is because they both have been, have participated in our um, Visiting Artist uh, project. And so they've each been invited by the museum, Virgil in 2016 and Chinupa in 2021, to basically re-envision our lobby space and to give us the opportunity to see uh, their work in progress. And so I would, I'm inviting each of them to just talk a little bit about their installation in the space and how it's been part of some of their broader um, projects that they've, they've created both here at the museum but then also in other exhibitions and other offsite. It's fascinating to me that both of you in the installations that you've done here, they've been part of a much broader 
uh, project and narrative that you worked on. So I'll, I'll hand it off. Maybe, Virgil, we can start with you since you did the 2016 installation. All okay, right, cool. I just want to say thank you for everybody uh, coming and supporting us. And uh, to both for done, I think, like, finally, like, we're hanging out together. We have actually, like, interacted closely for a long time. We've known each other for a long time, but this is an awesome uh, first time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, with both of us, it's, it was, it fits into both of our narratives and uh, the installations in the museum. So when, at that time, um, what all my work is based on is, is uh, educating the world about the 1680 February Vault. Uh, you, you guys all know what it, what it is. Um, a lot of people don't know what it is, like, especially here in New Mexico, uh, where it, it happened. And it's America's first revolution. People don't call it that because of the genocide that happened to the Pueblo people. It's not taught in schools, it's not in our history books. So um, I felt that the reason why I'm here is to uh, use art to educate uh, everybody about it. So I began writing a screenplay um, more than two decades ago, <laughs> aging ourselves right now. But uh, it just kind of slowly started building. I was super uh, inspired by uh, sci-fi uh, movies like Star Wars. Like I was thinking, I think it was like six or seven when I first seen the first Star Wars movie. So I started to reimagine, well, without reinventing the wheel, about how I could use art and imagery and characters to um, uh, attract a lot more people, especially the younger generation. Uh, how I was attracted to all these cool uh, sci-fi uh, uh, characters. So I, I ended up creating 19 different groups of characters that represent the 19 pueblos that are left in uh, New Mexico today. And uh, I wrote it uh, happening simultaneously in 1680 and also 2180, um, so that it's allowed me to create sci-fi characters. So uh, the head character, her name is Tabu, she's leader of the Blind Merchants. So she's a real important character um, in the whole screenplay and she, uh, stands for Women in Parliament, and uh, she was um, one of the reasons why I wanted to like give the uh, the women and children uh, uh, in public society uh, kind of like a superhero. So when I got invited to do the installation here, I wanted to bring the uh, the characters that are not, and we focus on that on those characters. But the are not are the public people in the future, and. They are coming back to the past and the present, and they're all collecting artifacts and shards and designs and songs and ceremonies and taking them back to the future, storing them, protecting them, so that when we get to 2180, we, all of our, uh, our culture, our ceremonies and songs are still alive in our designs. Uh, but that's who I concentrated on when I did the installation here. So, I used the whole wall and covered it with a, um, a street wrap, a big mural with um, Dao leader of the Blind Archers, um, facing off a Castilian an invader. And then outside of the entry wall was Translator. And Translator is kind of a, a character, kind of like a Yoda character that can uh, bounce between time dimensions, but helps uh, um, Dao all uh, pull out the public revolts in both time dimensions. And of course, um, addressing uh, Pope, who was the leader of the Pueblo Revolt. And he was from the northern Pueblo of uh, uh, Oke Wenge, uh, north of Santa Fe. But she's, uh, he needs a, you know, there's always a, a woman behind the man <laughs> to pull up everything. So he, she is the comrade to Pope. And that's what the solution was about. And I, this is the first time I've been back, so I can't wait to go check out your <laughs> the installation. It looks awesome with everything that you posted. So I can't wait to walk through it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so mine is here right now, uh, it's right outside. It's an installation um, uh, that the translation of it is the fat tanker's world is upside down. And so the idea is that there is a TV that exists in also like another dimension, imagined space, an imagined future. Um, I've been playing around with these ideas of indigenous futurism, uh, same sci-fi fan, you know. I'm also oftentimes thinking about the power of science fiction as far as its capacity to kind of like move people's ideas into the future. And um, being a science fiction fan, rarely do I see representations of myself or my culture in that space. And uh, 
rather than waiting for that to happen, I was like, oh, I could just, I could just imagine it. Like, I could imagine what that looks like. And, uh, and so I've been doing these projects that are called Future Ancestral Technology. And it's, it's looking at ancestral knowledge, um, cosmology, all of this sort of stuff, and trying to embed that in a future narrative. Um, and so the installation that's outside is, uh, it's an old technology, it's a TV. It's a TV that I recontextualize the poles um, using new material, considering the fact that TVs are built to be uh, uh, nomadic. They're supposed to move and travel. And um, I come from Northern Plains, so I'm, I'm, I'm from a TV culture, and I'm always like really hesitant about exhibiting that work because TVs have become a stereotypical uh, form, and I'm like, man, I can't even represent my culture due to all of this like stereotypical plains native kind of narratives. Um, so what I thought would be really fun is to actually transform um, the TV and move it through new materials. Uh, the TV as it exists and functions today is an advancement on an old form. They're using canvas rather than uh, hides, but it's been like relocated to this ancient time, and it's like, well, now that's how we do it. We make it out of canvas, you know? And I'm like, we don't have to. We can make it out of new and lighter material. We have the technology now. Um, and, and then the other question was the poles. The poles were designed for uh, movement so that you could travel with it. Uh, but I have, a, I have a TV skin at home, and my poles would be 20 foot long, and I'd need like a lumber rack or a trailer to haul the uh, TV, and I'm like, man, you are not as easy to move in present circumstances. And I was like, and like most of my peers, most of my friends, most of the people in my family who have them have these lumber racks, uh, but most of us drive like Nissan Sentras, you know, <laughs> like, like where are you gonna put a TV in a Nissan Sentra? So that was what I was challenging myself with, and uh, the TV that's outside that's hung from the ceiling, uh, the poles are telescopic, so they collapse down. And uh, I literally fit that TV in a Nissan Sentra. I rented one and was like, okay, here's the, here's the challenge. Can I put it in? Laid down the back seat on one side and collapsed the poles and put them in. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, but so I like the idea of this like, nomadic practice and how a nomadic existence is so contrary to our present um, ideas of our culture, but the reality of most people actually are incredibly nomadic at present, um, and we don't acknowledge or understand that. I mean, especially like my generation, the generation just after mine, like they ain't buying houses like you all may have, you know, they're living in tiny houses, you know, um, Airbnb all over the place. And so it's like, well, let me reinforce some of these customary ideas and actually uh, uh, embed that in a, in a cosmology. Let's, let's make nomadicism uh, have meaning again in the context of our culture, our larger kind of dominant cultures. Uh, and so the idea of putting that TV up in there, um, I had a new skin being built for it, made out of uh, <laughs> the latest uh, lightweight tent material, ripstop, ultralight. Uh, and the place that was building it for me burned to the ground. Um, so it was like a circumstance that uh, there, it's a, it's a company in Portland, Oregon called Portland Garment Factory. And uh, somebody just started a dumpster fire in their old building, which was made of wood, caught on fire, and then all of those synthetic materials on the inside that they would make garments with. Um, just went up in flames. And the, the material that I was using was like a dead stock material from Nike that they happened to get. So it will never be that. <laughs> uh, they are making me a new one, but in the meantime, I was like, oh, I put all of my eggs in that basket. Now I have to do this installation and I've got no skin. Um, so I chose to use like a, a crinoline or like a tool, like this lace net material. And ended up sewing that piece in my house. Uh, never actually sewing a TV skin before, but I was like, well, now's a good time to learn. <laughs> and uh, the effect of it is something that I really like, and I'm actually gonna probably play around with this concept a lot more. Um, there's something 
ephemeral about it or ethereal, if nothing else, you know. Uh, it's like a ghost image of a teepee. And uh, the idea of putting it upside down on the ceiling was that uh, some of the science fiction work that I do, I have to do in the present time. I don't have a time machine, unfortunately. <laughs> so a, a lot of how this future of ancestral technology projects lay out is I go camping in like post-industrial sites with my family and we wear regalia that's like a part of this imagined future. And, um, and so I'm constantly like repurposing material to be a part of that cultural context. <clears throat> and the TV that's outside, uh, I've done like a few performances and stuff like that. In those performances, I have to imagine my audience not there or my audience as ghost so that I'm moving through a space and everybody who's there in the present is already dead. Like they don't exist anymore because I'm existing in a different time as a performer. Um, and this was a way that I thought I could get away with that same idea by inverting it, placing it on the ceiling, um, staining and dyeing all of this uh, uh, wool. There's tons of wool that's out there. Um, that wool was repurposed from Albuquerque. Uh, the sun material uh, in Albuquerque makes like soundproofing. And they get this industrial wool from Germany. And I go and pick up a, like hundreds of pounds of their remnants and uh, dye it if I have to or reuse that. And so my practice is always built around what materials I have access to and I try to get them um, as waste materials. So I'm repurposing them. So the whole ceiling, the grass, the star patterns, there's like tons of numerical things that are embedded in cosmology that I'm not necessarily going to share with you all. Uh, but there is incredible amounts of intention that's embedded in, in the creation of the TV. And the TV itself by its design. Um, has like these kind of cosmic uh, relationships. And so I thought if I made the TV transparent, um, then it is completely out of reach of everybody in the present. And so putting it on the ceiling and inverting the entire world um, is kind of how it's represented right now. And I have to admit, I was completely enthralled and wanted to figure out all of the symbolism and the and what was happening in there and I, and I think Chinooka one of the things that I really learned in the exchange with you when you were doing the installation was that some of that information is not accessible and Virgil I'm already going to go off script I'm sorry <laughs> but this idea of the juxtaposition for both of you between your works making certain cultural information accessible, while at the same time preserving cultural information that isn't accessible to all of us. And I'm wondering if each of you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I would, you know, let me just jump in real quick. I would say it's maintenance rather than preservation. Um, the maintenance of certain information is totally embedded in indigenous cosmology and knowledge. It's, it's not a preservation model like most institutions, museums, and things that we have to engage with, but actually maintenance, feeding, taking care of, learning, and then telling that story to those who need to hear it. So. Yeah, it's like nur anything you nurture, it's gonna grow if you don't feed it. Yeah. Right. Right. So like, yeah, I mean, that's um, the reason why I do, uh, like the traditional work that I do is all uh, traditional, meaning that we go dig our own clays, we harvest plants to make our paint, uh, we uh, wood fire, with aspen and cedar wood and cow manure. So everything is uh, done as I was taught on my mother's side, they're all potters. So um, unfortunately now it's like all of the masters are dying out. And there was like maybe five or six families that were doing it using traditional methods and materials. But um, now that everybody in present times, they have kids, they work outside of the bubble. And to use all these traditional methods and materials is very time consuming. And uh, they know how to do it, but like um, again, it's just like if you weren't uh, brought up with it and then got into galleries early, then uh, being able to uh, make a living at selling art is really hard to jump in and like dedicate your the whole time to work with the, these materials. So that's what another reason why I feel that I was born is to uh, make sure that that tradition stays alive. And I found that out when I was a kid. I mean, a clay was around me um, since I was born. Um, 
and I, we have pieces like when I was six years old, kind of funny looking, but it was just, um, I did it the whole time. And me, me being the youngest of my family, my siblings, a um, uh, collector by the name of Robert Gallegos from Albuquerque, he would do wine trips. So he would come to the, uh, the potter's homes and you know, make purchasing, uh, uh, purchases from them. And he had seen, like what Koji was known for at the time was a storyteller doll, which is a seated mother carrying babies, or either an animal carrying his babies. And I, I learned how to do that. I learned how to do like traditional pots with the geometrical designs and earth elements painted onto it. But I guess just me having that kind of wondering why I started making figurative pottery and uh, uh, started painting them. And I guess what I, what I became interested in fashion. So like when I was like 16 years old, he asked my parents, like he was like, what is, who's teaching this kid how to do all these different types of figures that are not like, you know, that something that you haven't done. And I was experimenting, and that's what my parents had my back, said he's experimenting, so we're, you know, support him. So he's like, can you bring him down to my showroom in Albuquerque? And at that point, we never had him went there, right? So we uh, packed up, came down to the showroom, and when we entered the showroom, like we, we flipped out just because it turned out Bob Baggins had like the largest uh, collection of historic Cochini figure pottery from the 1800s. And the pieces that I was experimenting on looked exactly like them without seeing them. So at that age, I knew exactly what I was meant to do. And uh, having Robert Baggins as a, as a resource for us to go visit and to study these pieces that he had, and like how they're painted, how they're built. Uh, and they're all based on social commentary. So like all of the where the railroads were being laid in the area, so it brought more people in, right? And along with more people, entertainment came, like operas and circus sideshows, and all the potters were capturing them in time, making caricatures of them. So when you had access to Robert's collection, you get to see all these really, really cool, flipped out figurative pottery that were uh, meant to capture these sideshow characters. So there's like Siamese twins, tattooed bodies, there's like all the the crazy sideshows that you'll see in the old uh, traveling circuses. Mm. And I somehow I loved that type of artwork, so I had those resources, so I started commenting using the same traditional methods of materials, but only thing has changed is time. So now I'm able to comment on politics or you know fashion or whatever I want to do. The door is wide open. So uh, and then like to start creating all these sci-fi characters talking about the public revolt. I wanted to, I designed it to be able to uh, reach out to the next generation of potters and make it interesting for them so they it will spark an uh, idea and you know they could come to me and ask me and um, I'm willing to, I mean I'm an open book so share my knowledge and, and the hopes that they are, they'll be able to carry on the tradition as well. Thank you. Um, just staying on you for a second Virgil, um, one of the things that is fascinating to me for both of your projects is how they are part of much broader narratives that you're constructing and creating across all kinds of interesting materials. And so the the rise against the invasion as we see here and the couple of other images that I've shown, you know, show in different iterations that your uh, project has taken in different places. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe how the site specificity of the work perhaps gets informed by or changes with each iteration? Yeah, I mean, like, I assume we have ADD as well. <laughs> or uh, accelerated. Yeah. 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 So, like, we're, I mean, we always use, I'm always on the lookout trying to learn as many mediums as I can to out of necessity, right? I mean, like, none of the costuming, I couldn't go to Party City and buy any of these costumes that you see in the models. So, like, you know, my friends and uh, uh, family, I would do like learn how to body paint them. You know, I used YouTube as a as a uh, professor to learn how to fabricate and just learn all different types of fabrication. Right? So you start creating all your different types of looks and uh, the garments. And I taught myself how to sew. So it just kept going on and on and on. Then eventually started photographing and videoing and learning Photoshop. So I combined all these different types of mediums to come up with, to be able to develop these characters as fully as possible. Um, so that once we move into a production with um, a, a company that, I mean, you hear horror stories of how people's characters do change once it's like a script is sold. So I try to get, like uh, copyright protect um, all our intellectual property, and that's very important for all the next generation of artists to understand is that 
you, we all need to protect our intellectual property. And, you know, if you're going to get in this game, don't uh, put sacred uh, designs out into the world because most likely you'll get ripped off. So that's another uh, teaching point when we work with students is the importance of to, to protect their uh, IP. And uh, just don't, don't be afraid to try anything. And that's, you know, I, failures are our best, life, our, our best teachers. So I, I don't mind failing. I'm always going to continue to fail, but you figure things out how to, how to do it a lot quicker if you're not afraid to fail. So like the students I do work with, like, no more imaginary hurdles because they're never there to begin with. And it's always humans that are self-doubting themselves, like, oh, I can't do this, I don't know how to do this, and you're already like, putting up hurdles. So. Um, but then again, going back to the question, using any types of mediums that we can get our hands on to, um, to actually build what we're trying to uh, say and to uh, create characters and solutions like that. So. Chidupa, I mean, you're have, welcome to talk more about future ancestral technologies because I know you've done that in several spaces, but I mean, there are also all of these other incredible, you know, collaborations and, and um, site-specific as well as more broadly community-engaged projects that you've worked on. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I think same thing. I definitely, I would say it's an accelerated attention instead of <laughs> attention deficit. Um, and working with clay also, like you start working with these materials and there's an expectation of time. So whenever I'm building something, I'm building like two or three things at, at the same time so that I can jump while one's drying and setting up. Um, and then I committed myself to a lot of clay work for, for kind of years after being like a, a painter with, with acrylic paint and like paint markers. It's like instant gratification, and then you start working with clay. It's such a process. You know? Kicks kicks our butts, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. And but it makes you appreciate the process, you know, versus like the outcome. Um, it, uh, but I started working with with other materials. I mean, I always had it in in me. Um, uh, growing up on a ranch, you kind of like half-ass know how to do everything, you know, um, and then it's just practice from that point. Uh, sewing, I'm the oldest boy in my family, so I have two older sisters, and like hand-me-downs made me a sewer, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, trying to figure out how to <laughs> take darts out of a shirt or take the hips out of a pair of pants, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are they clothes like this? <laughs> I'm not shaped like this. Luckily, really baggy clothes was in vogue uh, when, when I was getting a lot of my hand-me-downs. Um, but uh, yeah, just like that necessity. Um, my grandmother was also a, a quilter, so she made star quilts and stuff like that. So I was always around the equipment, you know, and the machinery, sewing machines and sewing needles. Uh, but a lot of the work just comes out of necessity. And, and the work with textiles and all of these other things, they're, it's instant. It's once again, like looking back to that kind of more quick and instant gratification where I can sew on a thing and put it on my body and be like, okay, this, this is working here, or, you know, remove it and shift it and change it. Um, and, uh, and I tend to work with it. Uh, you can see on these uh, pieces here, there's like felt, you know, that comes off. These were the first pieces that I made when I first found that connection with uh, uh, some material here in Albuquerque. I, a friend of mine brought over like three trash bags of felt and they were like, we've got 300 pounds of felt, do you want it? And I had no idea what it was, but I was like, I'll take 300 pounds of just about anything and see what I can do with it. And uh, so they dropped it off at my house and uh, it had all these really bright colors and it was such a strong um, kind of durable material and, uh, and hot glue. It makes an incredible bond with, uh, with felt. Which I I was like so I'm so hesitant to work with hot glue just because of like the cheapness of crafting and all of this sort of stuff and the weight of that on indigenous uh, art making and stuff. So I was like I can't use hot glue. So I tried sewing it and then finally gave in and used some hot glue and I was like oh this bonds better than the <laughs> stitches do. Uh, and then that just opened up a whole kind of like instant uh, working with the material. So. Uh, yeah, these, these pieces that you see here are wearable, and I, I like the idea of creating wearable sculptural forms. Um, I did a lot of kind of figurative work up until this point, um, 
And on those figures would be like strange kind of regalia, regalia that wasn't necessarily embedded in any specific indigenous culture. Uh, I was really playing around with the idea of, of uh, regurgitating Indian art, you know, uh, through a lens and then selling that back to people who were interested in Indian art. And I was like, oh, I could put a like fakey little turquoise feather on this thing or like Chinese beads. Um, and, and, you know, and be honest about it and be like, oh no, this isn't, this isn't Mandan, this isn't culturally specific. This is literally what I've learned from watching the, the market, you know. Uh, and I would be honest about that. And then people were like, oh, I can appreciate your honesty on this. And so I was moving these little figures along those lines. But uh, I think that there is an increased interest. You can do that for a little while, but there's what you realize is there is a wealth of uh, information and tradition and custom that holds like a stronger narrative. And I think it's a lot more important rather than to play tongue in cheek to be, uh, to, educate in a way like the piece that's out here. Um, I like edu educating the fact that you can't know. Uh, and I think that that's something that's important for, for most people in the 21st century. There's an expectation that everything can be looked up and understood and uh, uh, digested uh, on like the most basic level. And I'm like, prof you know what's profoundly more interesting? Mystery. Like that, you can't know that, um, and that you might not have the the capacity to even understand it if I told it to you as simply and specifically as possible. And so, like these regalia forms, was like a way of kind of moving into a space where I could do performances that were I don't know, let's say ritualistic. It's not necessarily ceremonial, uh, uh, and it's not necessarily customary, but. I wanted to create these two figures in particular um, to go to super fun sites and mining sites, um, extractive industry sites, and wear these two regalia. You can't see or hear anything in them, so you have to move across the land, and the land <laughs> informs your movements. So it becomes, the land itself becomes the choreographer of the performance, um, and that like blinding and, and hindering your the senses that we are kind of like overusing, um, then you realize like if I wear this and I move on this place, I can feel and have to feel the land, like what that means to, to feel uh, your place on it, to navigate using your feet and your hands and your shins, you know. Um, and so all of that could be like documented, but the context of why it's created um, isn't necessarily part of what I share. Um, but they were built to apologize for the human-shaped things. Like before we do any environmental uh, uh, reparative actions, I think step one is saying I'm sorry, you know? And this removes gender and identity and everything when you wear these. Like it becomes a relationship between your body and the regalia, and so you are just one of the human-shaped things. Um, and that's what we're kind of put out there to apologize for. And their flashiness, their brightness, is to draw attention to that, to those movements and to those actions. I, I think both of you have touched on this a little bit already, um, but what I really love about both of your work is the way that you're engaging, as you're talking about, with place in terms of specificity and, and culture and artistic practices, but then you're taking it and moving it to this universal level where it becomes an imagining of sort of a broader cosmology that we can perhaps imagine in a futuristic way, but also in the present. And I think, you know, we've had a little bit of conversations around sort of time space and thinking through that. Um, maybe we could get into that a little bit deeper um, in this, in, and maybe Virgil will start with you since your image is up. Yeah, definitely. I feel like we both use white sands, and it's like a perfect backdrop because it's like another world, right? And I started shooting that like several different uh, times, but 
Um, also, like at Coach Day, we have tent rocks. I don't know if you guys know what that is, and that looks like another world normally place as well. And my next project for Indian Market that's coming up um, in August, and it's the 100th anniversary, we're shooting out at the Misty Badlands in Northern New Mexico, and that's like, it's very colorful, completely opposite to what the white sands is. But yeah, it just helps to incorporate as much as you can, and like, you know, all of the models that I use are our friends and family, and some of them that are here, like Rujo and uh, might say uh, that uh, I try to get, make, create opportunities for my team that they do work with and, uh, you know, help them get exposure and also um, just help each other because I'm always learning from them as well with the students and, you know, go on this journey ourselves and create together. But, uh, yeah, like I love incorporating the land and for photo shoots and video shoots. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Sorry, everybody, because I wanted to show a couple of images of Chiba's kind of site-specific place pieces so that he can talk about those as well. Um, I think this was also part of a broader collaboration. Yeah, and I wouldn't say this is necessarily site-specific except for the, <laughs> the, place. the world, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, this project, this I mean, this photograph was taken at, at the Institute of American Indian Arts and it was as I was culminating this, this other larger project. But I think maybe just to go back, uh, uh, I don't know if this is the one or, or time to talk about this one. Uh, uh, I think you know we're opening up this conversation around our relationship to, to land and to place and space and time space. You know, and I think that there's a really interesting conversation that could unfold in there because we are embedded in such an incredibly linear concept of time. You know, it's you know starting at this point, moving through, and I think. Indigenous artists are totally, uh, uh, especially through like the native art market, embedded um, primarily in a in a historical context, relegated to ancient times, you know. Um, and if not that, it's like romantic ideas of, of native people, you know, um, that's easily digestible. It, but it's not our truth, you know. Our truth is is. Uh, uh, difficult and based in survival, you know, um, and endurance. And I think that there's a really interesting conversation around that, not just to indigenous artists, but to us as a population, our relationship to time and space and place. Um, at some point, you know, this imagined future that I that I that I'm playing with, uh, we understand that there is that you can't have it. That the land is not yours. Uh, like, surprise, you're gonna die. You're not gonna make it. The cost of life is total. Uh, and uh, any concepts of ownership or possession of the land reinforces this idea that you are somehow greater and can be in command of. And then, you know, indigenous people are also forced to reckon with that concept upon contact as things were being taken away. And it's like what a what a strange concept to try to to try to convince an entire population that didn't have that kind of idea that you could own the land, uh, but that you were an extension of it. Uh, you belonged to it in a way, rather than it belonging to you. Um, and we have to reckon with that in relationship to the annexing of, of, time, of place, but also now time, like how. How strange is it to be embedded in a, in a different time space than everybody else? Um, when I enter into most museums, uh, pri pri primarily like anthropological or historical museums, my culture is spoke about in a past tense, um, which is <laughs> brutal. It's violent, like it's straight up violent. Um, I remember when I was in school, the only time Mad Men people were brought up was during uh, uh, Lewis and Clark uh, and Sacagawea being, being from a Mad Men village traveling with Lewis and Clark. And I remember my third grade teacher telling the entire class, and this was like an aside, this was her doing her like, you know, research and, and study and wanted to like hit it home with the, with the students in this third grade class that like the Mandan people all died because of smallpox, you know, after that. 
And uh, I was like, <laughs> actually, uh, no, they didn't. And she was like, yeah, I'm afraid they did. And I was like, no, literally, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm, there's, a, there's a reservation in North Dakota that I'm a part of, and then Hidatsa and Arikara. Uh Smallpox wiped out 90% of us, but uh, we're hard to perish, you know? And those who survived it somehow did it by gathering with the Hidatsa and the Arikara, you know, um, to be put on one reservation. And, you know, and I, I felt really proud to like correct that teacher. But like, as I got older, I was like, how many times as an educator did she tell an entire generation, an entire class, you know, of students that we were all dead? And how is that not just as violent as killing us, you know, to put in the minds of everybody else around them that we're gone, you know? Um, and I think about that. I think about that in relationship to, to how we relate to time in these linear ways. I think uh, Virgil and I are really looking at this idea of time is not linear. Like that there is uh, anything that we gather from our ancestral knowledge is embedded in our present by learning it. And the act of embedding that in your present is to allow it to be a part of a future. And then you know that that future will eventually be the ancestors of somebody else far beyond. And then that information and that knowledge is shared back, that they're referencing back. So that time in our mind is not this linear, consequential kind of thing, but something that slips in between, especially when we're talking about culture. Culture being in flux, culture being change. Um, and the adaptation of human bodies in relationship to time and space. Um, and so, yeah, I think <laughs> the regalia that's created, the culture that's imagined in these things, uh, the ancestors might not recognize it completely, but neither would yours, neither would anybody's, you know? And, and there's, an interesting, um, there's an interesting freedom in imagining a science fiction future and a future uh, that kind of pushes your culture through, that I think like we're what, like one of maybe 15, yeah. maybe, yeah. futurists yeah. thinking about indigenous space, you know, in future places. Yeah, to build, I'm very <coughs> proud of it. Like uh, now like indigenous artists are not afraid to speak their mind about being pigeonholed because like coming from a, a traditional pot, pot, like, country, <laughs> noble potter economy, they all expected me to do uh, story covers and plots. So I'm like, uh, uh, very thankful that I was able to get into galleries at a young age, but that's what they wanted. So I think that kind of challenged me as well, but so I started like just branching up and doing whatever and uh, make, making sure that I knew what was going to work. And then uh, just like slowly figuring out all the different mediums and like just, you know, with everything that, you're, that we see when we visit other countries or cities, uh, the nightclub culture, anything, just take all kinds of influences, but incorporate it into our storytelling. And then now, like, the next generation of indigenous artists, like, it's, it is the futurism that's coming out, and I'm very happy that it's happening, because uh, nobody should be, whether you're indigenous or not, should be held back, or, yeah. you know, like, it's, it's, it's nice to see it, you know, starting to sprout and bloom now. So I think it's really cool that we just keep on, you know, knocking on doors, opening them, you know, paving the road for the next gen. Totally, yeah. And like the, the um, so much of it's a mind space, right? Like it's one you engage with an economy that like has, likes to pigeonhole. Right. And every economy will do that. It's it's a question of, of uh, <laughs> supply and demand, you know? What's, what's the demand? What do they want, you know? And so that's what we want you to supply. Right. Um, but then at some point, uh, the people who are asking to, su to supply are imagining what that demand is through their asking. You know, it's like, this is what we want you to do. But at some point, that bubble bursts, right. you know? Right. And, and I think we've seen that a few times, you know, where, where uh, uh, older collector collectors of indigenous art have literally passed away, and it's, it is a small market, you know? Um, it's, a, it's a nice market to have, be, have access to, but it is a small market. And when they pass away, their collections are flood museum markets, you know, literally flood. And then there will be a whole generation of artists who were collected by this person, and they, uh, they're suddenly competing against their own work from 20 years ago, you know, that's coming out on the secondary market. And that's like an attack on their livelihood, you know, so what can they do? I don't know, and you, you see this, I always think of like, I don't know, 
I like to think about economics and economy in relationship to art making, uh, but also uh, economy that's not just monetary, but like social economies. Um, and I think the advancement of communication, the capacity to communicate to people from all over the place, and the influence that that has brought in, um, to perpetuate kind of romantic ideas or historical uh, uh, images, at this point we're flooded with so much information from so many different places that what you end up seeing is not, um, you can't like individualize each bit of that information, but a uh, wash of information and you end up seeing uh, these kind of connections uh, between cultures that have developed on different parts of the globe. And that always seems that always seems interesting to me, especially developing a science fiction culture, some futurist culture. It's like, well, what did we, what did we learn? What did we take from one another if we're not siloed in the, um, even like the idea of what it means to be uh, Mandan, Hidatsa, or Rikara. Like at one point, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Rikara, completely different people, you know? And then through a few generations of them being together, they still maintain their language, you know, they still maintain cultural practices, but they end up sharing so much that even our bodies are one thing. They're all three, you know? Um, and that's natural. That has happened throughout history, you know? Uh, until this point of reservation where people are isolated to be, you know, you're only that now, you know? And, uh, and it's like, yeah, but if you translate it, it literally just means the human beings. So human beings share, you know? They share information. What does it look like if we gather that, that sort of uh, in information, especially for a nomadic culture that moves from different region to different region? You glean information from people who are sedentary within that place, the protocols that are right for that land, you know? Um, and that's all shared. Well, and I think in listening to both of you, hearing, we started out talking about time space, right? And you involved in there also the diversity of materials that you're using and engaging with in different ways. And then now you're talking a little bit about even what is our own identity in terms of our own bodies. And when, if we think about each of those ideas, they're related in interesting ways because, and I think in conversations that we've had in the past, it's each of those elements that manifests in a way that influences how both of you are interacting with future generations and how you're thinking about activism and what activism even means, which you know what you called activism being human at a certain point. And it's, you know, it's like, no, it's not political. It's just being a human being and caring about the place and the people around me. So you know, if we think about it in those terms, um, Virgil, going back to you, I know that, that you've been super excited about some of the recent collaborations and some of the groups that you've been able to engage with, um, could you speak to that a little bit? Like many of the artists? Are yeah, in? yeah like, and I mean, students and yeah. you know I mean? It's so cool because like I was raised, you know, uh, with a traditional family at Kojini, so yeah, clay was there, but uh, and all the traditional methods and materials, but like about five years ago, then I started to, uh, when it's around, <laughs> you know, that was credit, credited, right, because uh, once I started posting, like other services, like we're noticing, like, oh, that's like the, not the type of the materials that we use. So I think at that time it was called uh, Periscope. It was like a, a live sharing app. So we would, uh, we built a little ceramics community on it. So we're able to, I was the only indigenous one on it, but it was really cool to watch them in their studios and how they were just unpacking these really beautiful blocks of clay, all nicely packaged. And then when it was my turn, I was like, you know, <laughs> crushing my clay and mixing out and, you know, going to show where I dig it. So that was like an immediate connection like that. So I was thinking of how we do it and how I was learning, like, because I never set foot in a ceramic store before. And uh, they were all asking me, like, like what kind of cone do you, what cone do you find it to? I'm like, I'm cone? Like ice cream cone? What are you guys talking about? So <laughs> it's just funny. I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't go to school for anything. So like the term, terminology was way over my head. I didn't know what, uh, you know, all the ribs are. And I was like, the ribs? What are you guys talking about? With, you know, it's the tool that you, they strike with. And I'm like, keep like this, and I held, I held up my gourd because our dad would grow gourds and make our ribs. It's the same the, uh, same type of tool. But yeah, like the chance to work uh, and start working at different uh, universities and doing residencies and 
being connected to all the students and again learning directly from them, but using the high fire play because uh, the traditional play and all the works stays at Kojiri and that's like the heart and soul of everything that I do. So every day it helps all the different types of mediums uh, orbit around the, the traditional play, but having access to the ceramic store and all the kilns and stuff that I was able to go travel to different universities and instantly fire them there and finish the pieces, but also the relationships that are built. Uh, and also specifically talk about the RG Ray Foundation. And um, I had no idea that existed until finally like I started making these connections that they invited us up there, right? And I had been talking with the director Stephen Lee for a while, and it's just our schedules did not match up and then the pandemic hit, so that pushed everything back in. I said, okay, like I'm just gonna go in September, like fully vaccinated, let's go try it. So, um, and then you went up like in, in March or April? Um, yeah, April, I think. So it's just amazing to see, like, utilize their all their resources, like all the hydraulic lifts, the kilns, the clay, the studio. It was just amazing, but the, the little valley that we built when we're up there, it was amazing to incorporate the students with, uh, invite them on the journey and learn from them what they're doing and then also teach them as well. And like when I left, I bought like a huge amount of clay and I just, I, I knew I was gonna use it all. So I just said, okay, you guys are all gonna go big. Like we never went this big before, like none of us did. And like we're just cracking up. We're like, okay, we have this sort of amount of time to just create as much as we can and utilize these uh, big kilns and get it done. And, you know, like I left all that clay for them. I said, now you guys have to promise me that you're gonna go big and like don't stop when I leave. And like everybody taking care of each other and just, you know, keep this community going. But it's just amazing to be able to learn and work with students. And like, you know, like Chris Casey is another friend from Albuquerque, like I collaborate with on uh, 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 utilitarian work. So like cups and shot glasses and pitchers and everything like that. So that collection will be coming out. But, it's just amazing to learn how to use walls. I never used walls before. I still have to cast walls, the way I say that, right? <laughs> just different types of like decals, like where normally the traditional, it, it'll take me like three weeks to paint on a traditional pot. So it's just, it's, it's so crazy. Like, you know, you can't, I never tried, you probably can, but I never tried it to put the traditional made pot in the microwave or wash <laughs> it. So it's like, you have confidence when you do the high fire material that you you can't do all that dishwasher statement all. So it's just awesome to learn all that and like to watch uh, to what, what, what you, you created out there. It's like whoa, no way, this is so cool. Like just how you know because it like you get you super excited, right? When you're there and like to be created in the Peter Polka studio. Yeah, and I was like what? Like I know these vibrations around there. I was like okay, I introduced myself and stated my purpose and asked for help and like for all these different types of. Uh, messages started to come to me, so my uh, type of work grew really huge. And I mean, it was just so cool to experience that. So all the, these works will be coming out during the uh, the Eight of Treasures show at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Bia in the Moral Lake weekend, and also for Indian Market and the new Vlad of Contemporary Museum in Santa Bia. So all those pieces will be coming out, and you'll see like the huge pieces and all the colors, and a lot of them, I, uh, had my friend Justin Reese, he's from Ohio, so I brought him on as an assistant. But my plan was to just really get him in front of these directors and introduce them to the Archie Bray so that he could also get invited as well and it happened. So, but to have a person that he's an expert at throwing, because like I do oil and spray for my pots, but he can do it on a wheel and go big. So we just combined our different what we knew best and like started cooperating with pieces. Well, we're excited to see this. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, I think Elizabeth gave me sort of the time up uh, signal, so we'll, we'll move to questions in just one second. I, there's, I, I feel um, obligated to do this at the current state of the world that we're in. And um, Chidibu and I um, worked on a project some time ago that was really focused, um, it was called Species in Peril along the Rio Grande. Um, and it was really focused on species loss and where we are in terms of the state of the environment. And this was a project that probably has touched me more than any, or taught me more than any of the projects that I've worked on because we were literally reading scientific studies together about species loss. And artists were invited to kind of take those studies and turn them into stories. 
And um, Chidupa created literally a life-size buffalo skeleton. And I just thought it would be remiss of us um, to not call attention to the environment um, in this current day, and I think this project is one of those that really does it in an interesting way. So yeah, I, I've been playing around with. So I'm, you know, Mad Dad's out there at River of Dakota. We're like Buffalo people, the Northern Plains Buffalo people, and so I have this kind of relationship with Buffalo, um, uh, and it, it shows up in a lot of different ways through all the things that you're seeing. I think that's the have. Sorry, uh, but uh, oh, there was one that's taken from. Yeah, I was looking for that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice one. I remember seeing that one somewhere. Um, yeah, we're looking at species in peril, species loss along the Rio Grande, and uh, I thought what would be really important is to talk about the cascading effect of removing apex species from your environment. And um, so instead of focusing on, because I knew there was a lot of artists involved in this, and they were all looking at species um, that are being threatened at present, I was like, well, let's also talk about species that were eradicated uh, uh, from a time back and the effect of taking an apex species out of the environment and how that shifts and changes and starts to put into play all of these other things. Um, and so I wanted to focus on, on buffalo, you know, buffalo moving 60 million, you know, buffalo uh, estimate traveling across North America um, that were eradicated within like 45 years, like total annihilation. Um, reduced to 60 million, reduced to like 1,500 um, in 40 years. And all of that being like, um, you know, there was an economy for the hides, and uh, boy, those tongues are delicious, you know, uh, narrative. But the reality is, it was a war of attrition to annihilate the Plains tribes. Like, we don't talk about that a lot, but that's like my peeps, you know. And I have like survivor's guilt of their eradication as well, you know, the annihilation of buffalo. And the influence of buffalo on so many cultures, uh, from where I'm from, way up north, uh, to folks down here, you know. And that, that nation, not an animal, not removed from uh, any sense of like uh, well-being or, or belonging, uh, was like totally eradicated. So I, I, I wanted to do a piece that was this large scale buffalo skeleton and then take it up to uh, uh, one of the tributaries of the Rio Grande and put it in the water and then run streamers off of it so that you could see, once again, looking at time, uh, see the like, that, that old narrative, you can't like, can't drink that water because there might be something dead upstream. And I'm like, yeah, there's something dead upstream, you know, for sure. And, uh, and as we look at our relationship to water and place and land, we also have to look at our, our own history, you know, um, uh, and what was killed. And so this, this piece kind of existed uh, for that. And this is, there's like ongoing things with Buffalo. Uh, actually, I have one in my studio right now that I'm working on. I got cracked up hands and thumbs from, I don't know, really picking up my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Just rough. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that we brought that into it. And the piece was called Belonging, you know? Um, and and uh, I like the idea of being able to share those sort of stories and also our connection to more than human kinships, you know? Um, and what that means not only for our past and our present, but what would that look like in our future, you know? To develop that. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, and um, sadly our time is up, but um, I, again, just both of you guys and what you're doing and the way that you're engaging, um, I think that the concept of seven generations looking forward and, and imparting and collaborating and maybe not being activists, maybe being humans, uh, whatever that means, um, I think it's, it's really important in the current moment. So I, and my final question that I was gonna ask you both was what questions you had for each other, uh, but I think we're out of time. to sign a copy if you're interested. Um, and I think that's happening right in the lobby, Elizabeth. 
no, in the shop. In the shop, okay. Uh, and also, just um, pay attention to these guys. They have exhibit Chinook Black. I can't even keep track of what you have coming up. I mean, you're all over the place. Ginger does. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> is the Denver uh, project uh, still up, or is that down now? Uh, the one in well, it's still up. It's just not in Denver anymore. So okay. it's a traveling exhibition. It went to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and in January we're setting up at. Uh, Peabody Essex in Salem. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a major credit to the women in our life, like gender and tish, keep our lives. They basically tell us where to be at what time. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise we'd be super lost. Totally. And give us all these amazing, <laughs> amazing images. <laughs> yeah, I would have been looking at nothing if it was left to me. <laughs> They're like, let me tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you guys again, and we hope to see you here um, again and often. And um, we just appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you for the opportunity. Everybody stay safe. Take care of one another. Peace, love, and strength. Happy holidays.